All right, so I, uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes in, in outer space in the infrared. I'm going to focus on dust particles in the infrared. There's gas. Uh, stars will even emit some in the uh, infrared. But I'll mostly talk about dust here. This here is a, a montage of uh, six galaxies that I've studied with a particular space-based uh, infrared telescope. And uh, what we're looking at here, at, at the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll, c I'll kill more lights and we'll have some nicer uh, images of some of these uh, galaxies. But what we're looking at here is a combination of uh, emission from starlight, emission from what I call large dust grains or classical dust grains, and then emission from some really tiny dust grains. And I'm going to get into some of the, the details and some of the science behind these dust grains. But uh, just for now, they're kind of just pretty uh, spiral galaxies. They might look like something our Milky Way would look like if we can magically zoom outside our galaxy and turn around and look back. So uh, six uh, beautiful galaxies in the, in the local universe that I study. Uh, are these in the local group? Those particular six galaxies are, are not in the local group. Turns out there's about 50 galaxies in the local group, but only uh, three of them are what I would call normal-sized galaxies. There's, there's the Milky Way, there's Andromeda, and there's M33, and besides that, they're all a bunch of little dwarfy galaxies <laughs> that are pretty pathetic. So I showed one of my research I was at the big telescope last night, and I was showing my research assistant some of the presentation, and he goes, what the heck does this have to do with dust? Okay, I'm being a, it's a little bit of a stretch here, but hey, there's, there's chunks of rocks in space, and uh, they span a range of sizes. This might be the most extreme uh, size scale you could think of. So yeah, there's, there's asteroids out there. Some of them slime into the Earth, become meteorites. A uh, fun little thing to point out is we've had some major extinctions, apparently, on Earth at, at these different uh, epochs. 440 million years ago, et cetera, down to the most recent one, 65 million years ago. I heard some cool theories about some planet X that maybe is in orbit around the sun, and every so often it comes around and perturbs the uh, asteroid field and sends a big rock towards Earth. Who knows? But uh, anyway, there are rocks out there, and this is what I would call very, very large dust grains. Um, this is an axis here that shows the uh, frequency of an impact on Earth, and then this axis here is how, uh, how strong that impact is. And so this is megatons TNT equivalent energy. Uh, just so you know, Hiroshima was about, uh, there are 77 Hiroshimas in one megaton. So Hiroshima is about up here. So in the upper atmosphere of Earth, we apparently have a, uh, a 20 kiloton. We have something that's uh, Hiroshima-like every year in the upper atmosphere of the Earth. Things like Tunguska, which flattened a huge uh, swath of forest in Siberia, only happens, uh, let's see, this is every 100,000 years. Every 10,000 years, million years, every, this is hard to read, isn't it? Yes, it is. Once a century is Tunguska, meteor crater in Arizona, and then global catastrophe is going to happen every uh, several million years or so, which is a little bit frightening to think about. Anyway, so uh, I also looked up some more things. We have apparently 40 tons of dust falling on Earth every single day. You know, you don't think much about it because some of it's going to uh, incinerate, right, when it comes in at high speed through the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, on average, it's something like one dust grain per square meter for every 10 hours. So this is where, one reason why I wear my bike helmet, because, you know, if I'm out there <laughs> biking on a long bike ride, now these little things are just floating down just gently like that, right? Well, I'm not cleaning it up. <laughs> so what is dust in space? Is it stuff that uh, causes you to sneeze? Is it things that uh, are conscious dark matter and they are especially attracted to adults? Is it pixie dust magic? What is dust in space? Is it something that Sagan talked about, where we're all made of stardust? Even uh, Genesis, talks about, Genesis talks about us uh, coming from dust, and we'll ultimately return back to dust. This is a picture from the Sistine Chapel here of Adam and Eve getting uh, kicked out of the Garden of Eden. All right, so a little more scientific introduction to dust. I'm going to kill the lights just temporarily right here. So this is a picture from uh, the center of our Milky Way. And a fun little anecdote about this particular image is it showed up on Star Trek once. It was some Alpha Quadrant 4 or something. We just had it in the background. But this is, the set, this is a picture of the center of the Milky Way. And we know that there's lots of stars in the Milky Way. And one of the questions that astronomers had way back early on was, uh, is the patchiness that we see in, this, in the Milky Way, is that due to the patchiness of the stars and their distribution? Or is it something that's uh, blocking that light from the stars? Is the, is there foreground material that is uh, patchy itself and making the background stars looking patchy?
This is a nice, yeah. You can ask me to do that. Oh, thanks. So this is a nice uh, infrared image of the center of the Milky Way. Turns out Herschel, uh, back around 1800, hypothesized that there probably was a patchy obscuration. And Trumpler, uh, more than a century later, uh, had this idea that uh, through observations that there was going to be dust in space. I'm going to draw a little cartoon on the board here. So suppose this is our, our telescope or our eyeball. What I'm going to draw here is uh, three identical stellar clusters that, well, they're pretty identical. They basically have the same size. So Trumpler did the simplest thing he could think of. He said, if all stellar clusters were the same size and they were just at different distances to us, this particular cluster would, what we would say, subtend this particular solid angle. Basically, it has a certain angular size on the sky. And if a cluster, say this is cluster A, if this is cluster B, can you see this on the board? Cluster B, of course, it's going to have a little bit smaller angle on the sky. And again, and using the simplest approximation that all these stellar clusters are the same, the smaller on the sky a cluster appeared, the farther away it would be. So suppose this cluster was twice as far as this cluster. Well, we know from basic uh, math that it, would, it should be four times fainter. And if this one was three times farther away than cluster A, it should be nine times fainter. And when you do the observations, you find that this guy is fainter than four times fainter. This guy is fainter than nine times fainter. So there must be something in between, something in, in outer space that's blocking that light. So it was sort of observational, the first observational evidence that there was dust in space. Uh, you know, by mass, it's a pretty small chunk of interstellar space. And I'm not even counting stars here. It's only half to 1% of all matter in interstellar space. Uh, most of it's going to be uh, gas and molecular gas. But it plays an important role. There's extinction, reddening, polarization, reflection, nebula. You know, astronomy is like any field. We've got all kinds of jargon flying around. So I'm going to go ahead and show a couple slides on some of these things. Extinction, a really awkward term astronomy has adopted to just mean that light's been extinguished, obscured, blocked. Um, reddening, here's a cool picture from, and I'm going to ask my assistant, please, to do this again. Here's a cool example of reddening. So these are lunar eclipses. This is uh, several lunar eclipses over a decade or so. And it's a picture of the moon, of course. And you can see that the moon looks red. So the idea here is that uh, the Earth is blocking direct sunlight to the moon. And the only light that's hitting the moon is sneaking around the sides of the Earth through the atmosphere. And this is uh, the opposite of what we would say to a little kid, why is the sky blue? Um, I think I should draw another picture on the board to explain this. Thanks. So I'll draw a picture of this lunar eclipse. OK, so sunlight's coming in. It's not going to hit the moon directly because the Earth is blocking it. Some of that light's going to sneak through the Earth's atmosphere. And it turns out that the light that makes it through is the longer wavelength light, or red light. The light that won't make it through and will get scattered away is the shorter wavelength light, or blue light, or, or, or purple light, ultraviolet light. So I don't know if Mike got into this yet, but the idea is longer wavelengths of light can sneak through gas and dust a lot more easily. And, and it's why the sky is blue and why uh, moons and lunar eclipses look red. Anyway, so dust has an effect of uh, reddening. And if I back up a page here, it also has, if you have a different perspective, it can also make things look blue. So instead of looking at light that sneaks through, if you look at the light that gets scattered, things will look blue. So here's the Orion constellation. This is Rigel. It's the sixth brightest star in the sky. And I haven't really drawn this to scale, but this is something called the Witch Head Nebula. And Rigel is, if everything, if everything, yeah, it does look like a witch, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, if everything was to scale, Rigel would be about over here, and then the Witch Head Nebula would be, you know, tucked inside the Orion constellation. So these, these two pictures are not to scale. But the idea is there's a big star over here throwing off lots of light towards this nebula, just a bunch of gas and dust. You can even see that the Witch, witch Head shape is being created by basically this gas being evaporated by the, the strong light from Rigel. And if you look at it from, you know, if you were over here and you had your, you, you were in your magic spaceship and you were looking through the Witch Head Nebula at Rigel, 
the Witch Head Nebula would look red because the long wavelengths of light sneak through. But we're over here at this perspective looking at the Witch Head Nebula. So the blue light comes in and scatters towards us so it looks blue. So it just depends on your perspective. This is what dust will do. It'll make things look red if you look through dust. It'll make things look blue if you look from the side. Oh, I got some cool gee whiz facts with dust. So it turns out that in, in outer space, and when I say outer space, I don't mean like in our solar system. I mean sort of in a typical region of the Milky Way in which we reside, you know, maybe eight kiloparsecs from the center of the Milky Way. It turns out that the typical dust-dust separation is 150 meters. That sounds pretty big. Well, it turns out if you took a representative portion of the outer space that was the size of the Earth and you compressed all the dust together, you would get one pair of dice. Now, what does that mean? I'm not quite sure what that means. Another thing that's pretty cool, though, you can say is outer space is really rarefied. That means it's not very dense. Uh, ironically, and kind of uh, in a funny way, the best vacuums on Earth, you know, in the most advanced uh, scientific labs, they can pump out almost all the molecules, but there's still some remnant uh, gas and pressure inside. The very best uh, um, vacuums that we can do on Earth are as dense as the densest molecular clouds in outer space. So outer space is really rarefied. It's not very dense. Anyway, if you took a representative chunk of outer space and you were able to compress it to the same density as the Earth's atmosphere, so outer space has gas and dust. Imagine taking all that gas, compressing it to the same pressure as we have on Earth with our nitrogen and oxygen. It turns out that dust is really uh, dirty compared to our own atmosphere. Um, if you, again, you're compressing that outer space to the same pressure as Earth. If you held out your hand, you couldn't see your hand at arm's length because there's so much dust relative to how much gas there is in outer space. Another way to say it is Earth's atmosphere is relatively pristine, not a whole lot of dust compared to how much gas there is. Outer space is completely littered with dust in comparison. It's a ratio argument, basically. Uh, this is a neat picture of the whole sky. Uh, we call this an Atoff projection. It's essentially the whole sky looked at in the far infrared. Why do we look at it in the far infrared? It's a good way to look at dust. Uh, I know Mike talked a little bit about uh, thermal emission, black body radiation. So you can imagine every little chunk of dust out there in outer space is going to be absorbing uh, photons of light from stars and they're going to heat up. Just like if you turn on Mike's uh, infrared camera once he boots it up and powers it up. If you look at each other, you'll be glowing in the in the infrared at 300 degrees Kelvin. Well, these dust grains, as long as they have a temperature, they're going to be glowing at, at a particular wavelength. Um, so go, getting back to this picture, this is uh, the whole sky in the infrared. Um, this here is just the plane of the Milky Way. So we say we've, we've, we're showing this particular representation of the sky in galactic coordinates. So the Milky Way has a lot of dust. And there are things like Orion and the small and large Magellanic clouds showing up here. And I don't know if you can see this, but there's some kind of S-shaped blue thing going on in this picture. Turns out that's zodiacal dust, so dust in our own solar system. So the fact that the Milky Way is oriented like this and the uh, solar system is oriented like this, it just says that the two uh, disks of the solar system and the Milky Way are oriented differently. If they were lined up, then the blue thing would be right along the same orientation. Anyway, so dust uh, absorbs energy from stars and just starts radiating thermal Thermal radiation, heat. Here are some examples of what dust looks like if you had a, a, a magnifying uh, lens. This one here is about 10 microns across. This is a few microns across. These are what we get in our own solar system. These are far larger than what you would see in a representative portion of outer space. The idea there is the solar system has lots of dust chunks flying around, and they're going to somehow uh, conglomerate, accrete onto each other, you know, sort of how the, the original solar system formed through accretion processes. So these are, these are not what I would call typical dust grains. These are what you would only find inside planetary systems. Could so you call this image again? That's the whole sky. Uh, but you said you gave it we call it an Atoff projection. It's portrayed in galactic coordinates. Atoff is A-I-T-O-F-F. -F. And depending on where you're looking in outer space, you get different types of uh, dust grains. You have certain dust grains formed around stars, some in just outer space, some around comets, some around asteroids. Uh, essentially, they're, they're carbon, they're iron, they're silicon, there's some magnesium. There's some water involved in some of these. 
On the opposite uh, e extreme scale, so I showed you examples of large dust grains. On the opposite scale are what we call polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. They're, we call them PAHs to just avoid a mouthful every time. And these are some theoretical models of what they look like. They're just carbon-carbon chains. And the white things here are hydrogen appendages. And I'm going to go ahead and get into some more details later on. But uh, they're, they're different than your, your classic idea of a dust grain. My classic idea of a dust grain is just a ball of carbon and iron and silicon and magnesium. These guys are more like sheets of paper. They're quite, kind of two-dimensional instead of three-dimensional. Um, here's again some more cartoons of these PAHs. And the idea is a, a photon of light comes in and it's going to deposit its energy in these PAHs. And what it will do is it might stretch them this way, it might flex them this way. There's all kinds of different modes that uh, could happen for excitation. This here is what's called a spectrum. So this is how bright uh, the sky is. And this is a function of wavelength. And these are what we call PAH emission features. So it turns out that if photons of light come in and they uh, agitate and excite these PAHs, they emit their own energy, and it turns out it emits in the infrareds. This is one of the things I do in the infrared is I look at emission properties of, of dust grains and PAHs. And they happen to show up at these wavelengths. Uh, I'll get back to some, some of the details why I'm showing that now. But a fun thing here to point out is that uh, PAHs are everywhere. You can see them in planetary nebulae, protoplanetary nebulae, reflection nebulae, uh, ionized regions, galaxies, stars. One, <laughs> one person uh, took a spectrometer and took a spectrum of the Orion Nebula. Then they took a spectrum of their car exhaust. And you can see that it's very similar. And they even they titled their paper, PAHs and the Unidentified Infrared Bands, Auto Exhaust Along the Milky Way. So these are pretty uh, mundane things that occur everywhere. The, if you think of like your fireplace and you throw in some wood and you start the fire, the flu, the stuff that's being ejected out of your uh, fire, they're just pHs, tiny little carbon particles that come together in, uh, in furnaces essentially, just like stellar atmospheres. Um, here's a warning from the EPA that you should avoid eating burnt chicken and, and wildfires because you're going to get exposed to pHs and uh, lawyers will help you file a lawsuit against <laughs> PHs if you want to. So like I said, uh, PHs form basically in furnaces. The uh, atmospheres of older red stars are a good place to form these PHs. Um, there's some theory that these guys are only going to last about a billion years. The universe is 10 times longer, older than that. So one of the semi-controversial theories is PHs will form in the atmospheres of old stars. And then they're going to get destroyed once they start traveling around in, in interstellar space, maybe through shocks or uh, photons from bright stars. And then, according to this theory, they must reform eventually in outer space. This is a, it's sort of a controversial theory, but it's, it's one I sort of adhere to. Um, a neat thing about dust, there was a mission called Stardust that uh, launched in 99, and what it did is it went and flew out to a comet and it collected samples of dust grains. So it's one of these weird things in astronomy where we're used to remote sensing. Everything is done remotely. In astronomy, you can actually go out and capture uh, dust particles. You can retrieve rocks from the moon. You can actually go into the laboratory and build uh, sample dust particles and take their spectra and compare it to what you see in outer space. It's pretty rare in astronomy to actually be able to do things on Earth and compare to what you see observationally. So that one of the, some of these astronomers did that. They launched it on a Delta II rocket. I have a little clip here. Let's see. Let's see if this works. Okay. Well. Yeah, it, it worked in my office, of course. You know the standard, the standard yeah. statement. I mean, just, you know, why don't you let me hit escape? Come on. What's that phrase, photodesorption? Uh, photodesorption. That that is where a photon comes in and it will uh, kick out an atom. That's photodesorption. You know, absorption is where you bring things on. Desorption is where you kick things off. So a photon comes in and kicks out. It's kind of similar to what Einstein came up with in 1905, the photoelectric effect, where uh, light comes in and it kicks out an electron. And he quantified 
matter. What's that? Yeah. Unfortunately, I can't move. I can't hit it. Here we go. Yay! But you can move the arrow off. Yeah, thanks. I was curious, Jane. You don't know how many porn experiences that has ruined for me. And how many it's enhanced. Yeah. Depending on the size of the arrow. An unfortunate association with footage of a